I'm Mehdi Hassan in Washington, D.C., locked down as a result of the coronavirus. For this special episode, I'll be going head-to-head -head with not one, but two guests, a Republican and a Democrat, on opposite sides of one of the most divisive issues in U.S. politics today, how to fix the healthcare system, especially in a time of pandemic. <laughs> The richest country in the history of the world spends more on healthcare than any other nation. And yet Americans have worse health outcomes than most other industrialized countries. Millions of people remain uninsured and many others suffer crippling debt from out of control medical bills. Some Democrats say it's time for a radical overhaul. When 30,000 people are dying each year because they don't get to a doctor when they should, and when a half a million people are going bankrupt, because of the dysfunctional and cruel system that we currently have. You know what? I think we will pass a Medicare for all single payer system. But Republicans on the right say more government will only make matters worse. With regard to the idea of whether or not you have a right to a health care, you have to realize what that implies. It's not an abstraction. I'm a physician. That means you have a right to come to my house and conscript me. It means you believe in slavery. My guest in the second half of this show is a prominent supporter of Senator Bernie Sanders, who will be making the case for a single-payer, government-funded health care system. Government doesn't have to suck. Obamacare repeal But my first guest, Lan Hee Chen, has advised Republican presidential candidates on health policy and remains staunchly opposed to a state-run health care system. Single-payer, free health care, Medicare for all, they might sound great, but like all visions of utopia, they ultimately produce a lot more harm than good. But does the coronavirus mean that the time for single payer, or Medicare for all, has finally come? Are Chen and his fellow Republicans defending a cruel status quo whose time is up? And how much longer can the US justify a system that makes some rich while keeping many others sick? Lani Chen, thank you for joining me on Head to Head. Thank you, Mehdi. Um, you said last year that the United States healthcare system is the finest in the world. Do you still stand by that description? I do, Mehdi. I, I think the United States healthcare system is not perfect, but I think it has a number of strengths that continue to persist. Uh, innovation, quality, uh, be, ability for consumers to access a choice of different care options. So yes, I do believe the American healthcare system remains the finest in the world. But Lani, even now, in the age of the coronavirus, with the US having the highest death toll in the world, more Americans dead than in World War I, and with a healthcare system that doesn't guarantee care to everyone, that's riddled with racial and economic inequities, and that clearly was not up to the challenge when the pandemic came knocking at its door. I think we have to take a step back, Mehdi. The healthcare system itself has actually handled the situation quite well. Uh, the leadership that we've seen in terms of some of the political leadership to animate the response to the coronavirus, that has been faulty. But the healthcare system itself, I would argue, has performed pretty well. Hasn't the coronavirus, Lani, exposed perhaps the greatest flaw of all in the US healthcare model, that employer-based coverage, getting healthcare through your job, simply does not work, especially given more than a 40 million people uh, in the US have lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. Around 27 million of them may have lost their health insurance too as a result of losing their jobs. That's a savage indictment of the way you run healthcare in the US, isn't it? Well, I disagree. I actually think in the United States, we have a system that is premised, as you noted, on the employer being the primary provider of health care healthcare insurance in the United States. That is supplemented, of course, by a robust public system that covers people who are older as well as people who are poorer. But the employer-sponsored system, actually, I'd argue, has been the linchpin of a quality system of care we have in the U.S. where people get access to a choice of different plans that oftentimes their employers help them to select. You know, healthcare can be very complicated, and without the assistance of an employer or another entity that can help determine, for example, what some of those plan choices are, it can be a very difficult field to navigate. So the involvement of employers in the U.S., I would argue, has been a net positive. Now, are there holes in the system? Absolutely. I mean, are right there now there are 27 million holes in the system, yes. Lani. 
There are 27 well, million holes and, and, in the system. And, and, That's how many people have lost health care in recent months. People have lost their jobs in Canada, in France, in the UK, in Spain, in Italy. But none of those people lost their health care when they lost their job. That only happened in the US. Well, and certainly it is the case that we need to have more affordable, broader options for people like that. I don't think anyone doubts, Mehdi, for a moment that we need a health care system that covers more people. I've certainly advocated for that as well. But Lani, I'm not even talking about the 30 million people who started the crisis without insurance in the US. I'm talking about 27 million people who had perhaps great insurance with their jobs. But when they lost their jobs, they lost their health care. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. The rest of the world looks at the US and thinks, that's mad that you do it this way. Well, a few things. First of all, the answer is not to abandon the entire employer-sponsored system, which does work for 100 million or more Americans. I think the question becomes, when people lose job-based coverage, what is the best way to fill in those blanks? And you're right. I think there needs to be a way to fill in those blanks. There need to be affordable choices that people can go to so that their health care isn't necessarily tied to their employer. But I'm not willing, nor am I ready to say, that we need to, to discard the entire employer-based system we have in the U.S. that does work quite well for the vast majority of Americans. So here's what it shocks a lot of people, both in the U.S. and around the world. Your country spends nearly twice as much on health care as the typical industrialized country. Americans also spend way more on prescription drugs than anyone else in the West. And yet you consistently get worse results, worse health outcomes than other similar countries who spend way less than you. Uh, you compare to other members of the OECD, for example, the U.S. has the highest rate of avoidable deaths, one of the highest number of hospitalizations from preventable causes, one of the highest mortality rates from heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, dementia, obesity, diabetes. It has a life expectancy two years lower than the OECD average. And again, that's despite spending twice as much as everyone else on average. Well, surely we spend too much. There's no question about that. So we've got to figure out a way to get those costs and that spending down. But let's talk for a moment about outcomes, because I think this is very important. There is this perception that somehow the U.S. healthcare system does not perform well on these basic measures. What we do know is that for things like cancer mortality, for example, the United States does far better. For certain kinds of heart conditions, the United States does far better. For certain kinds of, uh, of other conditions involving neurological issues or orthopedic issues, the U.S. system performs quite well. So I, I think it's fair to say. I, I'm not the disputing US that you do well on some measures. Well on all measures. I'm not but saying, not I'm not disputing, but on a lot of measures, uh, highest rate of avoidable deaths, one of the highest number of hospitalizations from preventable causes, and a life expectancy lower than everyone else. And you're spending twice as much. It's not even like you're spending less, so you're getting less. You spend more and you get less. How is that the finest healthcare system in the world? I just don't get it. Well, you know, here, here again, I think the fact that we do spend more is, is a challenge. I think we've got to figure out a way to get spending down. But what I've also said is that if you look carefully at some of our outcomes, if you look carefully at what we're doing, what we are providing is we are providing the most innovative healthcare system in the world. People have access to the most innovative treatments, the most innovative cures, and that access simply is not available in other countries. It's not available in other places. It's not available in the U.S. Canada, either. Hold example. on, Lani. It's not available in the U.S. either to 30 well, million people who have their health coverage. it's much more broadly available in the U.S. <laughs> Medi, it's much more broadly available no in the U.S. than it is in a place like Canada. Well, okay. well but it's much before, more broadly available here than anywhere else. Even before the coronavirus, Americans were pretty unhappy with their health care system. Tens of thousands of people ev die every year because they don't have insurance. And those who do have insurance have to deal with medical bills that are one of the leading causes, some studies suggest, the highest, the biggest cause of personal bankruptcy in the US. Again, something unique to the US. People don't go bankrupt because of medical bills in the UK, where I'm from. What do you say to all those Americans in debt about the finest healthcare system in the world? Well, I would say, first of all, we do need to do more to fix something called surprise medical billing, which has been in the news here in the U.S. The idea that someone can show up for a treatment, get treated, but because that person, that doctor, that facility wasn't part of their health insurance, they get charged a lot more money. We've got to fix that problem. So I agree with you there. We have a problem that we need to fix. Is the answer that you would take the existing system we have and try and build on it to get more affordable options to more people? Or is it to toss out the system entirely and go to something different? And, and, and my point, again, is the, the, the system is not perfect, but it is better than I would contend than other systems around I mean, the world. You're, you're in a minority of Americans on this. And Gallup did a poll just a few months ago. 63% of Americans believe the healthcare system in this country has major problems or is in a state of crisis. Um, we talk about you know, numbers and stats and abstract. Let's talk about some individuals. Cancer patient Susan LeClaire from Florida, late last year, was on the verge of filing for bankruptcy a second time 
because of all the debt she got from her cancer treatments, the amazing cancer treatment that you mentioned a moment ago. And she had health insurance. She was insured. Jessica Hillman from Illinois had a seizure disorder. She had to file for bankruptcy in 2016 because of all the medical debt she got dealing with that disorder. Again, she had health insurance. Isn't it outrageous what women like Jessica and Susan have to endure in the richest country in the history of the world? It is outrageous. There's no question about it. But it's also outrageous that cancer patients in the UK have to wait weeks for access to a specialist and weeks for access to their first treatment. The same thing in Canada. It's unconscionable that people have to wait that long to get access to basic treatment, not just for cancers, Medi, but for uh, conditions that are chronic conditions, for conditions that are debilitating. So I, I can tell you all sorts of stories from around the world that are unconscionable, that are just as tragic as the stories you've told me. That doesn't make the American healthcare system worse, Medi. It simply means that in each of these countries, we have problems we need to solve. In the US, we've got to solve it in our own way, just as people in the UK and Canada have to solve theirs. No one's disputing that other health systems don't have problems. As I said, I'm from the UK. There's a constant debate about problems in the NHS. The Canadians have debates. Everyone has debates about the health care system. I'm talking about problems unique to the US. In none of those other rich world countries do people go bankrupt. But those problems bankrupt. are not unique to the US. Do they US, go bankrupt maybe? because of their medical bills? People, let, me, let me give another example. People in Insulin. Other People in Canada don't die because they have to ration their insulin because of the high cost of insulin. They well, they die because the they don't get access to coverage. They, they, they die Crawford, because they don't get access to doctors. Jeremy Crawford, 39 from Dallas, died last year because he couldn't afford his insulin. Mika Fisher, 26 from Wisconsin, died in 2018, couldn't afford his insulin. Alex Smith, 26 from Minnesota, died in 2017. I could go on and on. This doesn't happen in Canada or France or Spain, it, Australia. People don't die because they can't afford insulin. Well, they die because they can't get access to, to care. They can't get access to treatment. They may have health insurance. You can't get don't access have to care, care in, the, in and, the UK? And, and that is, you can't get access to the care you need necessarily, no. Now, you may be able to see a GP, but good luck seeing an oncologist. Good luck seeing an orthopedic well, surgeon. We're talking about insulin good here right now. Good luck seeing a cardiologist. You don't need to see an oncologist then, if you have diabetes. Then, I'm talking specifically well, but, about insulin. But, That's a uniquely American. I'm bringing up problems here because these now, are uniquely you, American you are, issues. You are, you are right. We have, a, we, we have a unique problem with prescription drug affordability in America. We absolutely do, and you're right about that. But the answer, again, is do you take the system you have and do you throw it out? And the answer seems to be, uh, you seem to be suggesting, well, the system works better in other countries because you don't have bankruptcy, because you don't have high insulin costs. My point is simply, in those countries, those systems don't work particularly well in certain conditions as well. So you just have to, you, you have to compare apples to apples. Do you believe that pharmaceutical industries have done a good job in this country, given how high drug costs are, how high their profits are, people are dying from lack of insulin? Well, I, th I think you gotta ask the question, what do we want the pharmaceutical industry to do? And fundamentally, my argument is we want them to innovate. We want them to have new cures. We want them to be pushing the cutting edge on COVID-19. We want them to develop a vaccine. We want them to help us understand what are the frontiers of medicine and science. And we have a healthcare system in the US that allows these pharmaceutical companies to do just that. And that is why, again, not perfect, not everybody is affording the medicines they should have access to. But the pharmaceutical companies sh uh, are doing what we ask them to do by and large, which is to innovate and to give us new cures. Well, they don't innovate on their own. The government innovates with them. As you know, the single biggest spender on innovation in this country is the, the vast government. majority the National of biomedical Institutes innovation of spending is private sector. I it's mean, the National sector. Institute of Health, I believe, spent $32 government. billion dollars in 2017, which is half as much as the entire pharmaceutical industry put together. If you take remdesivir, you mentioned the COVID-19 situation. One of the only drugs that seems to work so far, remdesivir. Uh, Gilead Science is the drug company behind it, says it's going to charge $500 a dose per patient with insurance, even though they could break even charging a dollar a dose. The US government spent $70 million helping Gilead develop remdesivir. They didn't innovate that drug on their own, and yet everyone else has to pay a fortune for it now. Well, a few things. First of all, the pharmaceutical companies contribute a lot more in terms of investing in drugs that never make it to market, that never make it past clinical trials, but those are still costs that they have to absorb. But beyond that for a moment, I do think it's the case that when you look at something like remdesivir, the, the jury is still out. The jury is still out on how effective it is. The jury is still out on how much it will cost. And I would predict, Matty, when Gilead we get to have the said it will this, cost $500 cost a dose. dose is not going to be $500. That's what they've said. 
I'm just they, telling you what uh, the company said. Uh, 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 again, I think they are, what they're going to have to do is make a decision about where they want to price that drug, given its efficacy. Because I can tell you something, if it's not effective, they're not going to be charging $500 a dose. Fair enough. That much is for sure. So uh, uh, again, we've got to see where that goes. Lana, you're a Republican. You've advised Republican presidential candidates like Mitt Romney, Marco Rubio. Uh, right now, in the midst of a pandemic, your party is at the Supreme Court challenging the very existence of Obamacare, President Obama's signature policy to expand affordable health coverage to millions of Americans who didn't have it before. And again, in the midst of a pandemic, is also proposing $920 billion of cuts to Medicaid, the government-run health care program for low-income families. Is it any wonder, Lani, that people look at the Republican Party when it comes to health care and think, you're just cruel. You're willing to let people die without insurance. Yeah, I, I, I completely understand that point of view, Mehdi. And, I, and I, there are many things that the Republican Party and Republican leaders have done over the years on health care that I don't agree with. Uh, I think fundamentally it starts with needing to understand the value of universal care. I've talked about this before. Other conservative analysts have talked about this as well that for a conservative philosophy of health care to not include some vision of expanding coverage so that's more affordable, so that everyone can get access to it, I think that's a problem. Now, I will say this. Some of these public systems, like Medicaid, do need to be reformed because it is not the case that you can simply continue spending as much as you're spending, doing as much as you're doing, and expect those programs to continue to exist. The sustainability of those programs relies on good reform. And that's why it's important to try and think about efforts. But Lani, to make even if I were to agree better. with you, and there's a big debate about sustainability and debt and how much debt Trump has added, but the bigger question right. is in the middle of a pandemic, when, as we discussed earlier in the program, 27 million people may have just lost their health insurance, is now the time to be cutting Medicaid? Is now the time to be going to the Supreme Court and saying, strike down the whole of Obamacare, including patients who have pre existing conditions? 20 million people would lose their insurance on top of the 27 million who already lost it if Obamacare went tomorrow. Is this the time? No wonder people say, this is just heartless. Yeah, it probably isn't the time. Okay. Just putting coronavirus to one side, just on the bigger issue, why wouldn't a single-payer system, what people like Bernie Sanders call Medicare for All, which provides all Americans with uh, access to health care paid for by the federal government out of general taxation, why wouldn't that solve the problems of access of universal coverage, of bankruptcy, of high costs, all the things we've talked about so far, all the problems that plague the US healthcare system, that you yourself yeah. admit plague the US healthcare system. Isn't that why a majority of Americans, according to the polls, now support a single payer government funded Medicare for all system? Because they know the case is undeniable. Well, they, they support it until they find out more about it. And then the opposition increases. It, look, I, I think there's a few things. First of all, the, the idea of a single payer system the idea of having the government control a health care system, control the providers that provide that health care, is fundamentally based on the economic principle of rationing. It's fundamentally based on the notion of controlling the supply of health care. And when you do that, you can say people in the UK and people in Canada and people in other places have health insurance, and that's true. But do they have health care? And that, I think, is the challenge. It would not yes, improve of course they necessarily have healthcare. access to health care. You think people in Germany or France, Do which they? are widely now, considered to be better systems than the U.S., they come up higher in most league tables. You think people in France don't have health care? Well, they have health care. They, they, they have health insurance, but they don't have timely access to the care they might need. I'd go back to the examples around cancers or heart disease or some of the other conditions that we treat better here in the U.S. because fundamentally we give people access not just to health insurance, but, but to health But the French have better the health outcomes. Again, they have a better life expectancy. Is the they need to rationing. Let's, let's talk about say. those the OECD different measures. The OECD because OECD life, numbers life say expectancy, Medi, Medi, life expectancy is a function of many things beyond a health care system. Not just life expectancy. Yeah, I mentioned how hospitalization much people are smoking, rates, preventable where they're diseases. Living. We talked about a lot of indicators. Let me just pick you up on what... Again, pick up on, preventable diseases. Let me just pick up on that's your also on a, a measure that's related to social determinants of health. Let me pick up on rationing, rationing for a please. moment. I mentioned earlier, let me say it again. This idea that the U.S. doesn't ration and everyone else does, you ration by excluding 10% of your population from the health care system. 30 million people just written off. That's your way of rationing. We've got to figure out a way to get access for those people by That's lowering, not what I again, asked. lowering I know, the cost I know you want to give so access. I'm not saying. But would you, would you concede saying. that that is a form of rationing as well? You just cut 10% 10, 10 of your it's country not a form of rationing. Of we, we, we don't have waiting lists in the U.S. We don't have waits for access to specialists. We don't we have do waits have for access wait to for care. We do have waits for 30 million we people. We do have 
what who we don't do have health insurance. What Lani, we do have everything is a say system only that doesn't grant access to, to the 90% of people, people who have healthcare. Everything you're saying only applies to the people with healthcare. What? You're just airbrushing out 30 million people. No, I'm not airbrushing them out at all. I'm saying well, we how need to figure out a way to get those people How long is the wait for the answer? Well, what are the waiting not, times? For, the what are the waiting not, times for the 30 million people who don't have health care? I'm guessing pretty long. The 30 million people who don't have access to health care, unfortunately, they are presenting in emergency rooms and getting care there. But that's not cost efficient, nor is it good. We don't want them to be waiting to get preventive screenings, to be getting the sorts of things they need to be getting. OK, just before we wrap up, a lot of Americans are very familiar with some form of single payer or, or universal health care or government funded health care. You have the Veterans Administration, which provides basically government funded free health care to veterans. You have Medicare, which provides free health care essentially to pensioners. You have Medicaid, which you mentioned earlier, which provide support to low-income families, all government-funded, government-run to one extent or another. And when you look at the polling, Gallup does polling on this, polling finds that people who use the veteran system, Medicare and Medicaid, are all happier with their care than people who get health care from their employer or bought privately. That kind of tells you something, doesn't it, Lani? Y yeah, well, I, for, first of all, none of those systems are free. They all have a cost. They're all imposed in the form of taxation or other uh, cost to individuals. They're free to the user is the, the point. Obviously, not. they cost the, money, the, the, but they're free well, to the person not, using uh, it. You know, they're, 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 they're not necessarily free to the user either. There are still fees and such that individuals have to pay. The Veterans Administration is an interesting example. Uh, I'm surprised you find polling that suggests it's popular because it's actually one of the least popular health care systems in the U.S. In fact, veterans... Uh, by and large, many of them are actually quite displeased with the system and That's what it's done. That's not what the polling says, Lani. I, I can give is you the polling. Single September paper. 2019, 82% of veterans reported being somewhat satisfied with their health experience. Only 7% reported being dissatisfied. Somewhat the satisfied. Gallup poll, and somewhat the Gallup satisfied. Poll, look, and the look, Gallup here, poll shows that 77% of people who use veterans like it, 76% of people who use Medicare like it, 74% of people who use Medicaid like it, but only 68% of people who have employer plan like it. They're clearly more popular, Lani. That's what the polling says. Well, look, when you ask people whether they would want to go to a single-payer system if it meant, for example, losing the plan they have, losing access to the doctor they have or the hospital they like, uh, single-payer health care becomes dramatically less popular. So we have to be careful in using opinion polling. That can be manipulated, certainly. That's a fair point. And so I think this kind of an idea, that you could simply take the U.S. health care system and graft on some kind of single-payer government-run system, uh, it, it just doesn't work because it works in limited settings. doesn't mean it's going to work everywhere. Okay. You make fair points, and I want to put some of these points to my Democratic guest in part two of this show. Just before we end our discussion, one last question to you, Lani. Isn't the problem that Republicans like yourself simply don't consider health care to be a human right, unlike 130-odd countries around the world that do recognize a constitutional right to health care? And look, I know it's not in the US Constitution as a right, but you can't really have life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness without good health care, can you? Uh, you, you can't. I believe every American ought to have access to uh, affordable health care. There's no question about that. But they but don't have a right the, to health care. Access to affordable that, care is a very well, interesting but, phrase. But, but access Maddie, to affordable care is not a right to health care. The rights, the, the, the rights that we have as Americans are very clearly delineated. And so I, I, I quibble sometimes with the idea of trying to make this political point that because you refuse to say that health care is a human right, that somehow you're against health care for every American. I couldn't disagree more. I believe every American should have health care. But that doesn't mean that it is a right in the same way that we have enshrined in our Constitution. So you healthcare don't believe health care is a right? Important thing. And I just want to be clear here. Every so you personally thing. don't believe health care is I a right? I believe Put the Constitution every, to one side. I believe every single American should have health care. I don't believe health care is a right as stated in the Constitution. I do not, no, because it's not. Lani Chen, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me on Head to Head. Thank you, Mehdi. That's it for part one of this special Head to Head. Up next, part two, the other side of the argument. I'll challenge a prominent Democrat and supporter of Bernie Sanders on why he backs a government-funded Medicare for All system here in the United States. That's in part two, coming up in a few moments after the news headlines. <laughs>
Welcome back to this special edition of Head to Head in Washington, D.C., where we're debating the U.S. healthcare system. Should it be free for all and government funded, or does the private sector do it best? In part one, my Republican guest Lani Chen argued that more competition and less government are what's needed to improve the American healthcare system, one that he and the U.S. conservative movement believe is already the best in the world. In this second half of the show, I'll challenge Abdul El Sayed, a top US Democrat who ran for governor of Michigan, a medical doctor, and author of the book Healing Politics, on why he supports the exact opposite, a nationalized healthcare system, as a cure to what he and the left argue is a broken, unjust model. We've allowed our health system to run amok with profit motives both on the providing side, who gives you care, and also on the paying side, who pays for your care. What's the simplest way to make sure everybody has health care in a country where nearly 10% of us don't? You just make sure that the government provides it. But does US health care really need to be overhauled in such a radical way? As Chen and others are quick to point out, the US is a leader in medical innovation, is home to some of the world's top doctors. There are now 29 Nobel Prize winners. And boasts more Nobel Prizes in medicine than any other country. There's also the cost factor. Americans are much less keen on changing the system when they hear it could cost tens of trillions of dollars. So is the need for socialized medicine a healthcare reality or is it just ideological fantasy? And can Medicare for all, as it's known, really overcome opposition from the powerful healthcare industry as well as resistance from establishment Democrats and the Republican Party? I'm not a big fan of Medicare for all. I mean, I, I welcome the debate. This grand scheme ought to be called Medicare for none. Abdul El Sayed, thank you for joining me on Head to Head. Mehdi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, in your book, Healing Politics, you lay out your support for Medicare for All, which is Senator Bernie Sanders' signature plan that calls for a national, government-funded, what's often called single-payer healthcare system here in the US. You call that plan a simple, elegant approach to providing everyone with health insurance. How so? Well, Medicare for All is a government health insurance plan that would cover every single person from cradle to grave without having to worry about co-payments, without having to worry about deductibles or premiums. Again, words that nobody understands because they're insurance mumbo jumbo. And instead, we would all pay into a tax system that would cover all of us. So we'll talk about that in this interview. But before we get to that, the calls for Medicare for All have intensified, haven't they, since the start of the pandemic, since the uh, coronavirus got going. Is it your argument that if the United States had Medicare for all, a single payer system like Canada's or like the UK's, that we would not have seen the same levels of death and suffering in this country that we have seen? I think there's no doubt about it. Let's just remember that we've got 40 million Americans who are off the payrolls and in a system that relies on people being employed to get health insurance coverage, when then they become unemployed because of, say, a pandemic, they then lose their health care coverage in the middle of a pandemic. That's what's happened. 27 million new uninsured people in this system. It makes no sense. And had we had a Medicare for all system, it would not ha matter what happened to your employment. You would have health care and you wouldn't have to worry about that. But beyond that, there's also an incentive question. When you have 7,000 health insurers, which we have in the United States, who's left with the responsibility of preventing disease in the first place? Any one of them would say, well, if we invested in prevention, it wouldn't really pan out because people move between insurers so often. And that's why there's really no incentive to invest in prevention and public health in our country. And we've seen the consequences of that with continued cuts to agencies like the CDC and state but and local Abdul, health departments. You say there's so no doubt. I would say that, Abdul, you say there's no doubt that the U.S. would be better off if it had a single payer healthcare system going into this crisis. How then do you explain Italy, the U.K., which have longstanding single payer healthcare systems, universal healthcare, and yet they have been hit hardest among the countries in the West. They have the highest death tolls from COVID-19 in Europe, Britain and Italy. Even the presidential candidate who your party has nominated, who you support, you sit on his healthcare reform committee, Joe Biden. He said, and I quote, with all due respect to Medicare for all, you have a single payer system in Italy. It doesn't work there. It has nothing to do with Medicare for all. That would not solve the problem at all. When you look at Italy, he's got a point, hasn't he? With all due respect to Vice President Biden, whom I do support, we are 4% of the world's population. We account for 25% of all deaths to COVID-19. It has not worked here. And if you look at the long term, the long tail, right, that comment hasn't really aged all that well, um, simply because 
in Italy, they're looking at being able to send their kids to school next fall. They're not dealing with uh, a second surge. In fact, they've flattened the curve and it's stayed but you flat. Could argue, well, come on, flat Abdul, you're, you're a Democrat. You could argue that has more to do with the fact that Donald Trump is not the prime minister of Italy. Uh, when you look at healthcare oh. systems, though, the death tolls in the UK has a higher per capita death toll from COVID-19 than the US. It has the National Health Service, a single payer healthcare system. It didn't stop Britons from dying in massive numbers. So I'll say this. A big focus, obviously, you know, Joe Biden would have handled this uh, situation far better than Donald Trump did. Donald Trump continues to deny basic science, continues to deny that we're dealing with a crisis in the first place. So, uh, you know, let, let's 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 also agree that this is a far bigger uh, issue than simply what kind of healthcare system uh, a country has. But let's also be clear that in our system, hospitals were facing bankruptcy at the same time that they were facing COVID-19, um, and the, that fact alone is enough to ask whether or not this healthcare system ought to stand uh, as, it, as it is. Because the reason why is because all of our hospitals in this country are run on a profit margin. And those profit margins come from uh, the kinds of cases that had to be canceled uh, when hospitals were facing a potential pandemic. And so uh, they had to shut down their lifeline as they were getting case upon case of COVID-19, now not only fighting a pandemic, but also fighting okay, uh, to enough. stay open. That is absurd. And that didn't happen in Italy. It didn't happen in the UK. It wouldn't happen in a system where government actually supports hospitals to stay open, to provide the public good of having healthcare in the middle of a pandemic. But lots of death and suffering did happen in the UK and Italy, despite their single payer systems. And despite all the advantages of single payer, which you've, you've mentioned a few already, it does come with a trade-off. As my Republican guest in part one, Lani Chen, pointed out, it's, quote, based on the economic principle of rationing. Lani and others argue that if you're not rationing the number of people who get care, then you're rationing the care itself. And that's indisputable, isn't it? I mean, I'm from the UK. The NHS has many advantages over the US, but the reality is that you don't have all the same access to the same specialty treatments that you do in the US, certainly not in the same quicker time frame that you have in the US. Th think about what, what Lonnie is implying here. <laughs> we just celebrate, so in our country, right? Uh, we believe a certain set of ideals. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. Now, the idea of rationing care by people is basically saying, that some people can have all the health care they want and need, and some people just have to go without it. I don't know that I am comfortable living in a society where we just take that as the operating framework. I would much rather me and everyone else have health care if, say, they have a heart attack or a cancer or COVID-19 than the situation which where is, which no is matter a, what which is I a want, good argument, I, want it, I can get it. And, which and is a would, good would, argument, would, Abdul, but it I'll comes with a rider. This. Hold on. It comes with a rider. Why not own the fact that when you do that, people are going to get less access to treatments. They're going to have to wait longer. And Americans don't want to, rightly or wrongly, Americans don't want to. Uh, they don't want a system like the NHS or the Canadian model where you have to wait for hip and knee replacements. You have to wait for cataract surgery. You have to wait for some prescription drug. Why not be honest about the fact that, yes, we will give healthcare free to everyone, but it'll take much longer to get the treatment you currently get? If we want to be, if we want to be honest about it, let's also realize that in our country, even if you are insured, if you're one of the lucky 90% that gets access to healthcare, you're still waiting in line for treatments. And not only that, you're paying on the back end of those treatments. And so you may be insured, but yes, if you need to see a specialist for your cancer, the high probability is you're gonna be waiting in line too. And not only that, you're gonna to have to pay substantial amounts of money just to get the health care you already paid for on the front but end. Abdul, that the, makes Abdul, no the sense numbers, to me. The so numbers I'll just don't say this. support you. We already rationed Hold on, care Abdul, you know this. You've worked. We've already you, rationed you, care. You're a doctor. You know this. The numbers don't support you when it comes to specialist treatment. The Commonwealth Fund, which I'm sure you've heard of, health think tank, says Canada reported the largest percentage of patients. Canada, which Bernie Sanders often trumpets as his model. Canada reported the largest percentage of patients waiting more than four weeks for a specialist appointment and more than four months for elective surgery. In Canada, for example, 18% of Canadians waited four months or longer for surgery compared to 3% of Americans. Why would Americans say, yeah, let's switch to the Canadian model? Why would they say that when they hear those numbers? I'll just, I'll just ask you this, right? Are all, are all specialists the same? So Mehdi, if you need a cardiologist, right? Would you rather be in a system where you're gonna to move to the front of the line because you need a cardiologist independent of whether or not you're insured? versus an orthopedic surgeon. Now, 
don't get me wrong. If, if you have an orthopedic problem, you want to see your doctor. But in their system, they focus on needed care more than elective care. Okay. And I would rather live in a society, and I'm guessing you would too, given your experience so, in the UK hold versus on, hold the United on. So States. Let's talk about, let's where talk about if you have a life threatening, if you have a life threatening illness, that you're going to get the care you need when you need it Abdul, to save your you, life, even if it may mean point. that you're waiting a couple of extra fair weeks point. for non life threatening cases. So, would you call cancer a, a life threatening illness? Well, I'll tell you this: the number one cause of bankruptcy. In no, our no, society that's what I asked, Abdul. Would you call cancer a life-threatening life illness, Abdul? It's a very simple question. Oh, no. Absolutely. And yet, Absolutely. if you're diagnosed with breast cancer or prostate cancer, you want to be in the U.S., don't you? Uh, I mean, you're much more likely to survive from such a cancer in the U.S. than in most European countries. That's what all the stats say. If I have a zero-deductible health care plan, then yes, that is true. I'd rather be in the United States. The problem, though, is that too many people don't have that because Agreed. two thirds of people who get a cancer diagnosis. I'm not diagnosis disputing that, but if you look at go the big picture, a years. So, I'm, I'm not. I'm so, not defending so that. In fact, I raised these points with Lani in part one. Canada. I'm asking about survivability. If it's estimated, according to a study uh, in 2015, from 1982 to 2010, it's estimated that the U.S. averted almost 67,000 deaths from breast cancer compared with Western Europe. 60,000 deaths from prostate cancer quarter of a million deaths from colorectal cancer. That's a lot of people who are alive today, thanks to the US healthcare system, that you want to get rid of. Except for the numbers on Medicare for All suggest that we'd save about 68,500 lives if we, if we were to pass Medicare for All here. And that's the question at, at hand here. It's not whether or not I'd want to be in the UK. It's not whether or not I want to be in Canada. The question at hand is, would I rather live in the United States under Medicare for All or without it? In 68,500 lives a year, we would save under Medicare that's for All. One study, the a Lancet study that's been disputed by a lot of people. That's one study, as you know. Other studies well, don't put the number in 68,000. As I say, plenty of studies, though, agree that you, you're more likely to live if you get cancer in the US uh, than in Europe. Let's, let's broaden Maybe, the picture. I, I would ask, Sorry, is there any study that shows? Is there any study that shows that Medicare for All would cost lives in America? Anyone? Well, if you is if there you any at, study that shows if that you look at the cancer expensive? numbers and you compare Canada and the None. U.S., well, you're better you're better off in the U.S. Why are we cherry picking outcomes here? I mean, life is you, life. You right? said you said you said pick a you said pick a life threatening illness. I picked cancer. All of the other preventive costs. Okay, let's let's broaden it out. No, Even, no, I, I'm saying. Sorry, go on. I'm saying I'm saying. Look, that there are a lot of people in our country who die of diseases that are not cancer. Cancer is not the leading cause of death. The leading cause of death is cardiovascular disease. We have no incentive to prevent it in this country. There are a lot of people whom if they get a heart attack, they may get stabilized and then will not have the care that they need over the long term. Okay. They will die younger because they don't have that health care. I don't want to live in a society where any of my neighbors and my friends and my loved ones have to potentially go bankrupt because they got sick or not get care at all. And that's what we have in the United States. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to invest as America, not UK, not Canada, as America, in a system that provides everybody health care that would save us all money and I mean, would increase the I, number I, I of people take your who point. survive. I take your point, but I'm not the one who raised Canada. It's Bernie Sanders, a candidate you back to, constantly mentions Canada. Um, even with all the legitimate criticisms of the U.S. health care system, which you very eloquently raised so far, surely you would agree that the U.S. is still number one in the world when it comes to innovation in healthcare, in terms of developing new drugs, in terms of uh, new treatments, in terms of uh, healthcare across the board, the US leads the world. And many argue that Medicare for all would kill that innovation with its obsession with cost cutting and reducing pay and reducing spending. It would kill innovation in the US and the US is still number one in innovation. Surely you would concede that? Well, no, um, I would say that the reason the United States is the best place to innovate when it comes to healthcare is because we have institutions publicly funded, like the National Institutes of Health. Every single new drug that has been created over the past several years has had some benefit from money we, the taxpayers, invest into innovation through the NIH. And so I would actually argue that that doesn't go away simply because you're telling corporations who, by the way, buy those drugs from biomedicals, who started usually as NIH-funded labs, that somehow they're not going to be able to profiteer on the back end to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. Take a drug, hold on, for the example, US right now does, that Gilead Hold treatment. on, the US hold right on. now spends more than half of all uh, R&D spending is done in the US, more than half. That's with a US healthcare model that you don't like and you want to change. You're saying we can change the model, throw out the entire baby with the bathwater, and we'll still lead the world on innovation, we'll still lead the world on R&D, we'll still fund the world's innovation. That seems hard to believe. 
I'm saying we can throw out the bathwater without throwing out the baby. And the reason is the baby is taxpayer fu taxpayer that's, Come on, that's not true. The like taxpayer the spends There's a lot, but so do private taxpayer. companies. In fact, private companies spend more than the NIH. After the NIH has already eaten all the risk. Yes, you're right. The private sector comes in and it invests. The problem, though, is that these corporations are a lot more interested in how much money they can make off of it. It sets the price way too expensive so that people don't actually get the treatment that they need. Let me ask you this. Uh, countries like France and Germany, which have done better than the U.S. on the coronavirus, which whose healthcare systems are often rated much higher than the U.S., um, they have universal coverage, but they don't have pure single payer systems where the government pays for everything. They have big private elements, too. Why are you and, and Senator Bernie Sanders so insistent on getting rid of all private health insurance and getting just one government funded system in its place? Why are you such ideologues on this issue when other countries around the world are willing to kind of have a bit of both? Well, I'll tell you, there are also many, many countries around the world that are doing it the way uh, that Senator Sanders and I are proposing. Um, I have a lot of respect for the French and the German system. And uh, let's be honest, right? It's critical for us to move toward more coverage that's more equitable right away. And uh, I will say that um, I, I, I disagree with the way that we ought to do it, but I do believe deeply in, uh, in, in Vice President Biden's goals in doing that. That being said, if we ask ourselves what the most efficient way to tackle the biggest problems in our healthcare system are, to cover everyone, yeah. to reduce the bloated prices in our system, to do so equitably. Medicare for all is the most efficient, most affordable. It is the most equitable Even way Even if that's of doing true, that. and so why get rid of all is, private health care when the UK hasn't done that? Canada, which you often invoke, hasn't done that. In Canada, uh, I believe they take out uh, plans to cover vision, dental, prescription drugs. Why, why such ideologues? on the issue of private health insurance, when even the UK and Canada aren't like that? I'll tell you, I talked to my Canadian colleagues, I talked to my British colleagues, and both of them tell me that the biggest challenges to uh, the Canadian healthcare system or the NHS are the encroachment of private corporations trying to privatize the services that they provide. If you look at the biggest frustration that Canadians have in their healthcare system is that they have to rely on these private plans for things that ought to be included in the public plan. And my point is that if we're going to rethink the American healthcare system, let's do it right. Let's learn from our colleagues in those other countries. Um, and let's make sure we're covering the things that they want covered. What about the political viability of Medicare for all, Abdul, regardless of how good or bad the policy itself is? Bernie Sanders, when he was running for the presidential nomination of the Democratic Party, said he would publish a Medicare for all bill in his first week of office and get it passed into law in his first term. But those were kind of ridiculous claims, weren't they? At the time, they were, they were hyperbole. Medicare for all cannot get through Congress, especially when you have centrist Senate Democrats dead against it, as, of course, are every single Republican in the House and the Senate. It's just a non-starter. Well, I'll tell you this. Joe Biden is, is the Democratic nominee, and we are all going to work uh, with that administration to cover as many people as affordably and equitably as possible. That being said, we cannot take our eyes off uh, the goal. And the goal is uh, Medicare for all. And But it's an unrealistic you, goal about our under the time frame set by Bernie things. Sanders. That's why a lot of people say, look, even if I like the idea of Medicare for all, in theory, Abdul's very convincing. He's convinced me it's a great idea. The reality is it's not going to happen anytime soon. And why pretend it is when you look at Congress and you know Bernie Sanders was wrong to say he would get it done in his first term? There's no way even Democrats. Do you know how many well, Democrats, you Democrats signed on to Bernie Sanders' bill? 14, a third of them. He can't even get a majority of his own party. I feel like I feel like that the, 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 this conversation is sort of past the reality. Um, again, Joe Biden is the nominee, and I will tell you that the beautiful thing about democracy is that you can create massive amounts of change if the people want it. And what Bernie Sanders has succeeded in doing is making Medicare for all lingua franca in our healthcare debate. And uh, you look at where young people, in particular, are going, where they want in their healthcare system. They want Medicare for all. And if they don't like the centrist Democrats even, uh, and certainly the Republicans who are uh, representing them, then they have the opportunity to vote them out for somebody who will support Medicare for all or force them to change their perspective on it because that's what they demand. And there is no way forward on Medicare for all unless we are able to build the kind of movement that makes it possible. Abdul, one of the many reasons why so many Democrats, not just Republicans, won't back Medicare for all is because of what they consider to be the astronomical price tag associated with it. According to some studies, it would cost more than what the federal government spends on Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid combined. One study found that Medicare for all would have cost approximately $33 trillion during its first 10 years of implementation. How do you get political support for a plan that could cost $3 trillion a year?
for the next 10 years? Well, because it would save the average American family $2,400 a year. The fact is, is that people are getting wise to the ridiculous amount of money that we're paying into a bureaucracy that does not work because it replicates itself through 7,000 health insurers and lines the pockets of CEOs to the tunes of 10 to $30 million a year. Um, we could do a lot better and Medicare for all would do that. So yes, it would be expensive as a government program, but when it comes to real people and their pockets and their considerations of where they could be putting their money, I'm pretty sure that $2,400 could be put to far better use than some CEO salary. It's interesting you say the public are wising up to this and you know they're okay with spending trillions of dollars more because they'll save money. But the polling doesn't say that at all. In fact, a lot of the polls show that Medicare for All has a majority support in this country until you tell people that their taxes will have to go up to pay for this multi-trillion dollar plan. In fact, if you tell them there might be delays, uh, their support drops even more. That's the reality. When Americans are told you will have to pay more, in taxes, they say no thanks to Medicare for all. You, you guys just avoid that when you're making the case. But also when you tell people that they'll save money overall and that they'll actually get to see any doctor that they want, uh, their support goes back up. I I'll be honest with you. Look, the, the But even on the big picture, aside from the doctors, just let me just hit you with the polling numbers. Kaiser Family Foundation found 71% of Americans support Medicare for all in the abstract. But when they're asked, are you willing to pay higher taxes, their support drops to 37%. That's a big drop, Abdul. It's of course a big drop. But again, then you pull them and you ask them, do you recognize that it would save you money overall, right? All your premiums, all your co-pays, all your deductibles go away and people support rises back up. If you look at what studies have shown, right? 22 out of 22 studies surveyed in a, a, a recent uh, review article showed uh, that the Medicare for all would save both our overall healthcare system money and it would save individuals money. Um, $450 billion a year from that Lancet article, $100 billion to businesses, $2,400 per family on average. That kind of savings is something As you know, are, Abdul, are that Lancet article so, has been criticized for cherry picking numbers, for, uh, you know, picking the best case scenarios, for overestimating how much money would be saved. You know that. The Mercatus Plenty of other Center. studies show. Let's talk about the Mercatus Center. A, 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 a Hold on, it's not, it's not just Mercatus. the conservatives of Mercatus. Abdul, let me just jump in here. It's also the Urban Institute, which is a center-left think tank, which also said more than $30 trillion. I think Bernie Sanders himself in the past has conceded 17, 16 trillion. You yourself said it will be expensive. Let's not beat around the bush. Before we finish, one last question. Your party's presidential candidate, Joe Biden, whose health care reform committee you now sit on and who you're now rooting for, has taken more money in donations from healthcare and pharmaceutical industries than any other candidate in the race. He's dead against Medicare for all, to the point that he even suggested if Congress were to pass a bill, he might not sign it when it got to his desk. Now, given Medicare for all is such a big issue for many on the left, a deal breaker for some, how do you plan to get your fellow progressives and leftists and Bernie supporters to get behind Joe Biden in November when he's so dead against the signature policy of the left, Medicare for all? Well, my, my message to progressives on this is pretty simple. We can spend the next four years fighting for more health care for Americans at a more affordable rate, or we can spend the next four years fighting against the repeal of the ACA. And I uh, believe that Joe Biden recognizes that right now we need leadership to take on things as basic as recognizing the science behind this pandemic. Yes, I supported Bernie Sanders in the primary, but for damn sure, I'm going to support Joe Biden in the general because I know what Donald Trump would mean uh, for people who look like me and millions across this country for whom j four more years of Donald Trump would devastate their lives and livelihoods. Abdul al Said, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me on Head to Head. Nadi, it's always a privilege and, uh, and thank you for a vigorous conversation. That's our show. Head to Head will be back next week. <laughs>